Thank you, Pastor Mack and our worship team. Good to see you here today at Hermantown Community Church. If this is your first time, love to get to know you better. Uh, make sure you fill out one of the Connect cards. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Ask God's blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, thank you for our church family. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. <clears throat> and you are a great God, and we give you glory. Speak to our hearts today. Help us to listen to your word and to not just listen, but to be doers of your word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I went by <clears throat> the cemetery and I buried both my mother and my father there at sunrise. And so as I drove by on the way to church, I pulled in and walked over and again saw them, their, their names, and realizing that someday I'll see them again face to face. Pretty exciting, the hope we have as Christians, isn't it? <clears throat> How great thou art. And that's the greatness of God Almighty, that, that Jesus Christ said that we will rise again. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air with the Lord, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. What a promise. What a promise. And God is not a man that he should lie. And someday we're going to experience that. You might say, well, it seems so hard to believe. <clears throat> yes, it does. But look at the human being. Pretty hard to imagine something as wonderful as a human being just somehow happening. The master designer created us where we can hear, we can see, we have cognitive ability, all of the things that God has given us. And he created us in his own image. What a wonderful God. So he is able to do that. <clears throat> Um, how many parents do we have here? How many young parents? Okay, still hands up, yes. I just appreciate the parents that get their kids up for church and they get them ready and they bring them to church. Uh, week after week, they help minister. What a beautiful thing to see that because it's not easy. Uh, we just, <clears throat> this week, my wife and I had grandkids camp at our house and after two days of fun I was totally exhausted <clears throat> I can see why you have kids when you're young and uh, we had a wonderful time we uh, made cakes together we made pancakes in the morning we went down on the train did things we usually don't do went to the uh, the William Irving uh, tour we had just a blast but uh, the reoccurring theme of the weekend was, girls, if you do this, if, if you're good now, and you eat all of your food, then you get dessert, right? If you do that. How many of you parents have that? Little contingency, the word if. If you do this, then you get this. Girls, if, if you're nice to each other, you can stay up late, all right? They're cousins. <clears throat> if, well, as you look in the Bible, there are continual similar words from God. If, that little word if, if you do this, then I'll do this. You see, and today we're going to look at that because it's very important for us to understand this. God our Father gives us these similar things throughout his word uh, we're going to start in the Old Testament. Let's turn to Psalms 37. <clears throat> Beautiful psalm from King David. We'll start with verse 3. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. <clears throat> Commit your way to the Lord Trust in him, and he will do this. He'll bring it to pass. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noon sun, noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. 
for evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. <clears throat> we'll look at a few of these verses, and then we're going to jump to some other uh, scriptures as well. Um, if you want to make a note of this, you can, or a mental note. I call it my part, God's part. My part, God's part. He gives me my part to do, and then he does his part, right? And so it's very important. And throughout the scripture, you'll see, just like with my little granddaughters, if you do your part, eat your supper, then I'm going to do my part, and I'm going to get the ice cream. All right? So my part, God's part. And it's throughout the scripture, and when you read your Bible, and I hope you're reading your Bible, you'll see that theme in the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, all, always that theme of, if you do this, I'll do this for you. We looked at Israel, the same thing. If you obey my commandments, if you follow my word, you'll be the head and not the tail. If you follow me, uh, you'll, you'll conquer nations. But if you don't, this will happen. And so today we see, here it says, trust in the Lord, <clears throat> verse 3, and do good, and you'll dwell in the land. Trust in the Lord. A very important part of Scripture, isn't it? Uh, trust in the Lord and do good, and you'll dwell in the land. Uh, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. That's my part. And the promise is, and he, God, will give you the desires of your heart. My part, delight myself in the Lord. His part, to give me the desires of my heart. That verse I had to show God again when I was at Bible college uh, in Ohio and when Karen sent me a Dear Thor letter and told me not to call her anymore uh, that it was over and, and, uh, and I was pretty sad about that <clears throat> and so I, I said God here I am at Bible college I'm, I want to serve you with my whole life and I said your word says if I delight myself in you and that's what I'm doing that's why I'm here that you will give me the desire of my heart and Karen's the desire of my heart. And God was faithful. Isn't that wonderful? Anyone else? That's wonderful. God, if we delight ourselves in him, he will give us the desire of our heart. I believe that. But we have to delight ourselves in him. We follow him. And he knows what's best for us. Isn't that great? God knows what's best for us. Uh, commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. That's our part. And he'll bring it to pass, the King James says. God will bring it to pass. I commit my way unto him. Katie is going out to college on the East Coast, right? You're committing your way unto the Lord. You're trusting him. And he's going to bring it to pass. He's going to do the things and de as you delight in him, give you your heart's desire. Beautiful to see our young people that love the Lord, putting God number one in their lives and and growing that way. <clears throat> so as we commit our way unto the Lord, he'll bring it to pass. It says, if we rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him, and they that wait upon the Lord, it says they will inherit the earth. We, we sometimes get concerned because it looks like those who don't love God seem to receive all the blessings. But I want to tell you that God has blessings for you that you could never imagine. And be patient. Wait for him. Don't fret because of evildoers, the Bible says. Joshua 1.8, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua 1.8. Uh, it tells us our part, and then it shows us what God's part is in this verse. Okay, Joshua 1.8, one of my favorite verses. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. So you may observe to do all that is written therein. For then you will prosper, and then you will have good success. My part. What's our part? To meditate on this. God's word. How often? Day and night, right? And not just meditate on it, not just think about it, but then observe and follow the things that it tells us to do, right? So if you're a student of the word, which you should be, 
If you're studying God's Word, if you're in the Bible, it'll tell you, children, obey your parents, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. All right? That's important, isn't it? Uh, it will tell you as children, honor your father and mother. That's our part, which is the first commandment with the promise that you might have a long life upon this earth. Honor your father and mother. So we have our part. God will do his part. Joshua 1.8, if you study his word, if you get into his word, it will tell you wonderful things about raising your family. It'll talk to you about finances. It'll talk to you about problems. It'll talk to you about bitterness. It'll talk to you about uh, forgiveness. It talks to you about everyday life. The Bible is relevant for today. And that's why we have to tell others about it, about it. The Bible is relevant for today. A book written over uh, 2,000 years ago. Think about it. This book is relevant today. For today. For every person. And so we need to learn these very important things. Joshua 1.8, to trust in the Lord. To, to, or Psalms. And then Joshua, to uh, meditate on him day and night. Proverbs 3 it goes along with some of this. Proverbs chapter 3. You have your Bibles. And I did all my studying out of the King James Bible, so some of the wording might be a little different, but same meaning. Proverbs 3. And we'll start with <clears throat> verse 1. Verse 1 is our part. Verse 2 is God's part. So let's look at that together. My son, do not forget my teaching... But keep my commands in your heart. That's our part, right? For they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Whose part is that? God's part. Our part, again, is to not forget God's teaching. <clears throat> Verse 3. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. That's our part. Love and mercy, faithfulness. God's part. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. So we do our part. God will do his part. How do we know that? Because this is his word. And God is faithful to his word. He is always, always faithful. My part, God's part. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's our part. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. How many times do we say, God, I just don't understand what's happening. What is going on? Don't lean on your own understanding. Instead, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Right? With all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And here it says... He will make your paths straight. Isn't that beautiful what God will do? If we trust him with all our heart. And not to lean on our own understanding. These are important words for all of us. <clears throat> Verse 7. Our part, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. God's part. This will bring health to your body. And nourishment to your bones. Isn't that beautiful? Bring health to your body. Health to your body if we're not wise in our own eyes. If, if we're not prideful. If we're not arrogant. But we fear the Lord and we hate evil. It'll bring health to our body. And nourishment to your bones. Verse 9, our part. Honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first fruits of your crops. It's telling us to be faithful in our giving. That's our part. God's part. And your vats will brim over with new wine. Your barns will be filled to overflowing. My part is to be faithful in giving to God's church. God's part is to take care of us. Right? That's very important. All of these scriptures. <clears throat> Verse 11. My son, do not despise, I'm sorry, verse 10, uh, 
or verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves as a father, the son he delights in. God will discipline those whom he loves. And so when we get off away from some of these teachings, he comes to us like the father and he disciplines us. He'll tell us this is what you need to get back on track. My part, God's part. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he shall go. That's our part. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Whose part is that? That's God's part. My part is to do the training spiritually, to bring our children to church, to nurture them, to pray with them, to read with them. God's part is what they're, when they're old, they will not depart from that. They'll come back to their foundation. Very important. Now, in the New Testament, <clears throat> we'll see some different things here. As Jesus shares some things, uh, we need to understand there's still this theme, our part and God's part. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. Uh, let's look at that together. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. Jesus is just starting his ministry. <clears throat> And as he was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, it's a beautiful sea. It's about 14 miles long. It's a freshwater lake where Israel gets most of its water, fresh water from, about seven, eight miles across uh, with uh, the beautiful uh, Mount of Beatitudes on the end where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And it was where Jesus was walking near Capernaum and where he did the majority of his ministry in this small area uh, in Galilee. And Jesus says he sees some fishermen out there. As he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. They were cast in a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. Whose part is that? That's our part. When did Jesus call you to follow him? When did that tug come on your heart to follow Christ, to give him your life? When Jesus reached out to you, come and follow me. Come and follow me. And then he said, I will make you what? Fishers of men. Is that just for pastors? Is that just for apostles? Is that just for the elite? No, it's for every person that would follow Jesus. Jesus says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. How beautiful. I'll make you fishers of men. That's why we started this church 23 years ago. Because when I was a young 12-year-old boy, I followed Jesus. He said, come and follow me, and I said, yes, I will. And he said, I'll make you a fisher of men. God wants us to do that. That's why in junior high and high school, I prayed with friends in school. I told friends in school about Jesus. I told friends in, on the basketball team about Jesus. I shared my faith with others. I invited as many as I could to come to church. That's one of the reasons, because Jesus says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. How's fishing? How you doing? Are you, are you fishing for men? Is that even on your, uh, your heart that God wants you to be a fisher of men? He wants you to be concerned about their spiritual well-being and their eternal well-being? I'll make you fishers of men. That's what Jesus said he'd do. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And so God wants you to do that. He wants you to be a fisher of men. He wants to, he'll give you that power. And it says in, in Acts chapter 1 and 2 that uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us that we have power now to be witnesses for Christ. He said you'll be witnesses in first <clears throat> Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then all the way to Hermantown. Did you know that? It said that. 
the uttermost parts of the earth. You ever feel like you live there? All the way. He said all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth. Last winter, I felt like I was at the uttermost part of the earth. I felt like uh, there was just very little civilization left. When you're stuck in your house and all you see is snow, and then when you want to go outside and cross-country ski, you have to bundle up every part of your skin, right? <clears throat> and you have a mask over you, so you, when you take your first, I suppose, uh, few steps out there, you're already breathing uh, real heavy, at least I am. And you're, you're, you, how many remember last winter? We're going to lose half of our congregation to Florida if this keeps happening. And, and so we, we really need to pray for a mild winter here. And so uh, here we are to the uttermost parts of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses. Jesus <clears throat> gave us a commission. We're not just to be comfortable coming to church and enjoying life on planet earth. He gave us a commission, and that was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded them, right? Commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. My part is to go, to teach. September 7th, I'm going to start a new series on the teachings of the Master. And I believe it can be revolutionary as we look at the teachings of Jesus Christ from his word. It can be revolutionary for you, for your neighbors, for your family, <clears throat> when we look at the teachings of a man that was only here for 33 years, and yet he changed this planet like no one else. He changed our lives today. And that's what we're going to be looking at together, the teachings of the Master. So we need to do our part, <clears throat> and certainly Jesus and our Father will do his, their part. Matthew chapter 9, we need to pray. Uh, we need to pray. Mary Kay reminds us and her missions team about praying about for our missions. Uh, 937. When Jesus, we'll start with 30, 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. We need to pray to God that he would send out workers into the harvest Missionaries, we support over 30 missionaries. And as we support them, as you have that opportunity, don't just give money in the offering plate. Pray for them that God would anoint their ministries to reach those who need Jesus Christ. That's what God has given us to do. We need to do our part. He'll do his part. <clears throat> Turn with me to uh, Luke 14. Luke 14, and we'll look at verse 16. At least we'll start with verse 16. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At that time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. <clears throat> Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. That's the only good excuse. The servant came back and reported this to the matter. master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, <clears throat> the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, What you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told the servant, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. 
I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. It's amazing, uh, some of the statistics believe it was that uh, 80% of people that are invited to church will come if you ask them. That's a pretty amazing statistic. Eight out of ten. <clears throat> hey, we're having a production at our church. That's why we're doing Scrooge this Christmas again. Uh, and you should really get involved in that. It's an amazing production. If you, ha if you like acting at all, or if you want to help in this, uh, and start praying for it. But this is a way to invite someone out at Christmas time that maybe would never come to church. And they'll come and hear how God can change a life. It's a takeoff of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. And in the end, Scrooge gives his heart to Jesus and he's a new man. And that's the hope that God gives us at Christmas. And so uh, that'll be this Christmas. Get involved in that uh, wonderful production, uh, Scrooge. And so uh, here again... Uh, people uh, were invited to come. They were invited to come. We need to invite people to come to church. That's our part. Jesus said, go out and invite them so my house may be full. God wants us to reach a lost and dying world. It's not that hard to invite somebody to come and sit with you by church, go out for coffee or breakfast after, uh, and 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 let them hear about Jesus. You may say, I'm not a preacher, but that doesn't mean you can't be a witness and invite people and, and not threaten them. <clears throat> Here, 80% will come if they're invited, but only 2% of God's church in America ever invite somebody to church with them. Only 2%. That's an amazing statistic, <clears throat> and it means we need to get going on this. We need to start inviting others and loving others and, and bringing them to God's church. We need to do that. But yet people are afraid. Think about it <clears throat> for a minute. Why don't you invite someone to church? Just think about it for a minute. Why don't you bring others to church? I won't put you on the spot, but you can think about it. <clears throat> well, here's what some of you would be thinking. Well, the pastor might preach too long. <clears throat> Someone else might be thinking, I don't know if they'll like the, the music. Someone else might be thinking, I just don't know if they'll like me after I invite them to church. Maybe they won't even care for me anymore. And we get nervous thinking of everything. What's going to go wrong in the service? What's going to happen in the service if I invite somebody? And we get nervous about inviting a friend to church. Maybe pastor will preach on a topic that's uncomfortable. And I may. But guess what? If we do our part, what's our part? To invite. And if I do my part, I preach. And God will do his part. He's the one that saves, right? And my Bible says, because of the foolishness of preaching, men will be saved. I love being a preacher. Because I know when I preach God's word, lives are changed. Lives are changed. When you preach God's word, lives can be changed. Not everybody will hear. Not everybody will receive. Your friends may not like you anymore. Guess what? Jesus said, they didn't like me. Do you want friendship with the world? Or do you want to be favored by God? <clears throat> it's amazing. Mark, how long has it been now since you've been coming to church? That's what I thought, six months, six months. And had your wife invited you many times? Many times. And you finally came. But, but the amazing thing is, you were invited many times, but finally you came. Um, people can only have so many excuses. 
right? And finally, they'll come. I was looking in my notes, and I don't know how Margot started coming here, your wife. Somebody invited her? Somebody invited her. And she came to church. And in 2012, she gave her heart to Jesus. Pretty amazing. And here in 2014, you come. And I think it was the first Sunday you gave your heart to Jesus, didn't you? I, the, the, the thing that is amazing to me is here's a man that, uh, 60, is that right? 61. 61. Finally comes to church and hears about God's love and he gives his heart to Jesus. Last week he broke the law. Uh, he was down in the cities or two weeks ago, right? And two weeks ago, I called and I said, we're having the baptism, just a reminder, uh, if you can make it. And they called me back and they said, we're in, we're in the cities, we have something going on, but if we can, we'll get back. She said, he sped all the way home. He never speeds, but he was speeding all the way home so he could get baptized at Pike Lake. Isn't that exciting? <clears throat> When he shared a little bit of his testimony, Mark said, all I can say is I've been changed from the inside out. That's what it's all about. That's what Christianity is all about. Being changed from the inside out. You can go to self-help groups. You can try to read books on getting better. But it's only when you're changed from the inside out that you will see true, wonderful, lasting change in your life. And that's by becoming a Christian and receiving Christ into your heart. And when we do that, when we do our part, he'll do his part. I'm so excited. I, I just thought those words were so real. I've been changed from the inside out. That's what this world needs. Believe me, if... This entire world would allow Jesus to change them from the inside out. We would have peace on earth. And that's what Jesus will do someday. He will bring peace because he's the prince of peace on this planet. Change from the inside out. And that's what God wants. So this man had a great supper. It's symbolic of the, uh, of the wonderful supper. The, uh, the marriage, the supper feast, uh, the marriage of the lamb, the supper of the lamb, uh, the picture, you see the long table, the marriage supper of the lamb. That's where Jesus is kind of intimating this wonderful supper. He's inviting all these people to come to heaven to this great celebration, but nobody wants to come. Nobody wants to come. That's what God wants to change. God wants us to do our part. <clears throat> He'll do his part. Margot invited her husband. Somebody invited Margot. They invited, but God did his part because by the foolishness of preaching, Paul said, men will be saved. As we preach the good news of Jesus Christ, as we work together as God's church, we do our part. He'll do his part. He always has, and he always will, but we need to do our part. We need to pray. We need to look and have compassion <clears throat> on the fields on the people. <clears throat> John chapter 4 is an amazing chapter. I'm going to tell you the story. We'll look at it together. John chapter 4. It's the story of the woman at the well. And in this story, and I'd like you to read it in its entirety on your own. I'm not going to take the time to do that this morning. But Jesus was there in Samaria and a Samaritan woman, uh, verse 7, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink of water? <clears throat> His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. Woman, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, 
and he would have given you living, living water. Think about that. Now, Jesus started this conversation. It's like you at work. This, this whole chapter has a lot about witnessing. <clears throat> but Jesus started the conversation. We need to I initiate the conversation. He asked for a drink of water. She said, we're not supposed to talk to each other. <clears throat> Jesus said, if you only knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink, the gift of God. She didn't realize she was talking to God Almighty, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. She had no idea. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. <clears throat> Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons, his flocks, his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I just want to tell you that that's so true. You know, the things on this earth do not satisfy. I don't care how big your car is. It's not going to satisfy. You know what's going to happen? It's going to rust. It, it's going to have problems. Maybe you'll get 200,000 miles out of it, and then you're going to have to get a new car, another car. And you know what? If your car really makes you happy, come and talk to me. All right? Because you've got a serious problem. All right? So these temporal things should not satisfy. But Jesus Christ truly does satisfy. He says, if you have this water, you'll never thirst for anything again. And I found that to be true. When I received Jesus Christ, nothing else could ever match. Nothing else could ever fill that void that he filled in my life when I received him by faith. <clears throat> and so they continue with their dialogue. <clears throat> this, the woman said, sir, give me this water so that I won't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming out here to draw water. She's still thinking it's just about water. He told her, go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, he said. She replied. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. In other words, he's saying, you've been shacking up with different men. You've been living a life of immorality. <clears throat> And the guy you're with now isn't even your husband, is it? What you have said is quite true, she said. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Can you imagine? Just think today, honestly, if I told you everything you've been doing for the last 10 years in your life, how you've been living, you've had five, six different relationships. You've been going out on your wife. You've been doing this. It would get your attention, wouldn't it? And it really got her attention because she was talking to Jesus Christ. I can see you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but the Jews claim that the place where you should worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, <clears throat> Time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, it has now come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's true worship. It's not about a religious name in front. It's about a love for God and for Jesus that comes from our heart, where we worship him because he's worthy. <clears throat> Time is coming, now has come, where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him <clears throat> in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. She was so excited. She had heard about the Messiah coming. Just think, the next statement, what she would have really felt in her heart. Then Jesus said, 
I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came, returned, and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. <clears throat> but, but no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the when she left her jar. She was so excited. <clears throat> she went back to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. He said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Then the <clears throat> disciples said to one another, Could someone have brought him food? It's the guys, they just cracked me up, the disciples. I mean, he's talked to them about all of this stuff before. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. All of these things. And, and, you know, did someone go to McDonald's while we were gone or what? You know, we went to get food. Did he, and now he says, I've, have, I've got food to eat you don't know about. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say four months more and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crops for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. <clears throat> the inviter and the preacher may be glad together. Those who witness, those who pray with somebody will be glad together. You see, we need to do our part. God will do what? His part. If we do our part. That's God's word. If we do our part, he'll do his part. Thus the saying, one sows, another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Amazing verse. Many of the people. She went and affected her entire community, telling them about Jesus and how wonderful he was. Many people were affected by one person, by you. Just think how many people you can affect this year by inviting them to church, by loving them, by sharing God's love with them. One person affected an entire community. One person affected them in such a wonderful way. <clears throat> so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers in Jesus. In Romans 10, it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. That's our part, isn't it? To believe in him. <clears throat> it says that, how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? That's why this congregation, I appreciate so much your faithfulness so we can preach to youth, to children, so we can preach to people who have never heard about Jesus because of your faithfulness. We need to continue to work together. <clears throat> Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's God's part. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, that's our part. I'll come into him and I'll live with him and he with me. Isn't that beautiful what God will do? We need to do our part. God will do his part. There are many people that have never received Christ by faith. They don't know what it is to be a true Christian. We need to do our part. Maybe you're here today and you're not even sure if you've received Christ. 
and have a true relationship with him. You can because he's knocking at your heart's door. But you need to do your part and open the door and receive him by faith. John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. We'll become his children, but we need to receive him by faith. <clears throat> We're having a block party. On Wednesday, the September 3rd, we want to reach out to our community. We want to give supplies to children. We've been given a gift for our street team, and we want to give supplies to children who have needs. If you know of anyone, let us know. School needs, going back to school, we'd like to help them with that. Uh, September 7th, I'm going to be starting my new series on the teachings about Jesus Christ, our Master. Invite somebody. You have two weeks to pray about it. Invite a friend, a neighbor. Uh, invite someone to the block party just to have fun, to let them see. Christians are normal people. They can have fun. Invite somebody. I'd like you to close your, bow your heads and close your eyes just in prayer today as we consider God's wonderful word. <clears throat> I'd like you to just, first of all, ask yourself, who can I invite and and why haven't I been? And I have to start. I have to stop making excuses. It's not what they think about our church or about me. It's, it's about them hearing about Jesus. And make a commitment to start being an inviter. And then if there's anybody here that would say, Pastor, I'm just not sure if I'm really a Christian. I'm just not sure. But today I'd like to receive Christ. I know that he is knocking at my heart's door. I can feel that. And today I'd like to open my door to him and receive him by faith and turn from my sin and follow his teachings. I want to be changed from the inside out. If that's you today, just slip up your hand. If there's anybody here that hasn't made that commitment, just give you a moment. Again, we're not going to embarrass you. This is... A wonderful opportunity for you to know Christ personally. If you're listening online today, you can go to the place where it says need Jesus and we'll pray with you right there. And you can let us know and we'll send you a Bible and help you grow spiritually. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our church family. I pray that you would bless them, encourage them, Lord. Uh, each one of us, help us to uh, reach out to this world with the love of Jesus like never before. In your wonderful name we pray, amen.